Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to have everybody in the house of the Lord with us this morning. We've got a little bit of a different service. I feel like calling it a COVID service just because we had to cancel our in-person service today and do online only uh, due to the plague running through the Albertson household and um, different ones getting sick. So we didn't want anybody else to have that. We had planned a uh, kind of a kickoff service for the new year, and we didn't want that to... Uh, go by and not have that and um, so we've got together this morning uh, there's five of us here and there's a tremendous presence of God we spent the last 40 minutes or so and just praising and worshiping God and really feel the presence of God uh, and along with that we are very blessed to have uh, brother and sister Hudnall with us Tim and Brenda Hudnall from Florida and I tell everybody they are very good friends and somehow We've managed to sucker them up here from Florida to Iowa for the beginning of January. Now, I'm just going to say this. You have to know that they're good friends. If they would leave Florida and come to Iowa and hang out with us, and not only that, but we managed to give them the plague, and, um, and they were up all night. And, uh, but really interesting story, and I, I don't know what Brother Hudnall will share with us this morning, but in the midst of the plague, God... Uh, met with his people and then in the midst of worship this morning God met with his people so I know you're at home and I'm just going to ask you right now if you just stretch your hand out toward the pulpit and you'd say God bless brother Hudnall as he comes I don't know if he's going to sing or dance or what but I'll tell you something's going to happen that's all I can say so God bless brother Hudnall praise the Lord praise the Lord praise the Lord everybody First thing I'm going to do is <clears throat> give praise to the Lord. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to ask my wife to stand up and testify. We don't usually. Oh, I have to bring her. That's okay. That's good, too. Praise the Lord. God is always good. And um, I'll tell you, we were given the testimonies on our way to church today about all the wonderful things that God has done for us. And I'm just so thankful that I serve a God Amen. that is enough. Amen. He is enough for everything and every aspect of my life and for my family's life. And he is enough for everyday life. And he's enough for my future. And I thank God for my God that I serve who is enough. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. I'm going to uh, go over something real quick before I get into what I was going to say. And I'm still going to say it, praise God. But, uh, you know... People read the word faith, and the dictionary has it listed as a noun. And so when we read the word faith, we're thinking noun, name, noun, okay? But it's not like that. Faith, actual faith, is a verb, okay? It is the expression of faith, the action of faith that ensures you of your salvation. The gospel is what saves you. You've got to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Amen. Amen. And you have to believe in Jesus Christ. And that doesn't mean passively. It means you actively have to believe in Jesus Christ. How do you actively believe in Jesus Christ? Well, we understand that it's by his death, burial, and resurrection that we even can conceive of salvation. And how do we actively conceive of that? By repentance, baptism, and receiving the Holy Ghost. And there is no way around that. There is no other gospel given among men 
whereby we must be saved. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That name is Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I just wanted to go over that because we sometimes circumvent the fact of the gospel. But it is in the belief in Jesus Christ that we can begin to express faith. Amen. Amen. We don't passively express faith. We don't. We can't. Brother Albertson and I were having this conversation and we were talking about the expressions of faith, the different expressions. Most religions will tell you, you can sit there passively and quietly and express your faith. You know, there's multiple ways to express faith. There's one way to express faith. That is to repent of your sins and to be baptized in Jesus name and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost well what does that do well according to the scripture when you do those things you will speak in tongues you will have the authority to cast out devils you will pick up serpents And they won't harm you. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. That does not make me a snake handler. But the Bible clearly states that when you receive the Holy Ghost, you will be able to tread on scorpions and serpents or serpents and scorpions. So you have the power of God to do these things. But I want to read a scripture about the power of God. It is in Romans chapter 1. Let me get to it. And it says, Now concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Okay, that's one point. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness. Now, we get that kind of misconstrued. But let's, give me just a second. What is according to the power of the spirit of holiness? What does that even mean? It means that there's a reason for us to be holy. And everybody has a pastor and pastors have a hundred thousand different expressions. You know, holiness is not necessary. That's the guys that are the extreme liberals. Then you have the guys that are just kind of liberal. You know, well, I think there's a few things that are necessary. And then you have the more conservatives. They think a lot of things are necessary. And then you can go on over and the tail, the pendulum skips to the other side. You've got your extreme liberals that think there are many things that are necessary. And then you have your guys that are all the way off the scale. They believe everything is necessary. And I'll be honest. Holiness is not what you think. Everybody's like, well, it's a standard. No, a standard is a movable scale. And that's why you'd like to call it standard. Because you want to keep the flesh in control of the scale. And God is in control of the scale. It is by the power of God through Jesus Christ and the expression of faith and the spirit of holiness. That means that this is an issue of the heart and the spirit, right? In other words, if you're going to clean your act up, washing yourself on the outside but not changing anything on the inside does not matter. There are a lot of people that look good. Their skirts are long enough. Their sleeves are long enough. 
They've got everything in place. They've got every physical thing laid out on the table. They've dotted their I's. They've crossed their T's. they put their periods in place. But they've got a bad attitude. They've got an argumentative attitude. Or maybe they've just got a contrary attitude. How about this one? How about they've just got an attitude? And, well, I have a right to my own thinking. That's not scriptural. That's not biblical. I, I thought, you know, we talk about good, we talk about evil, and we want good. We want good to prevail. We want things that are good. And I'm going to say this, Brother Albertson, and, you know, maybe it's something that uh, should be left to more affluent speakers. But the problem with people is we will trade good for godly. And that's not how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to be godly, not good. Amen? What did Adam trade in the Garden of Eden? He traded godly for good and evil. What did Eve trade? She traded the same thing. She wanted to be wise. We live in a generation that is earmarked with we want to be smarter we want to be wiser we want to be stronger we want to know more we want to have greater increase we want to invent more things why don't we just come back to a place with god so he can be preeminent in all things amen Amen. and when i say that i mean it because We don't have to have a contrary attitude to stand against God. We can agree with God 100% and have our own thinking. Our own thinking. 100% of our own thinking. (laughs) You know, I mean, I, I, I don't agree with everything that I read, but I'll be honest, I agree with everything that I read in the Bible. But you know what? I know my flesh. I know the man that stands here, okay? And I know who I have to live with every day. And I have to find a place of repentance, not surface repentance. Most people think about repentance like, oh, I'm sorry for the things I did. I'm sorry for the thoughts I had. I'm sorry for this. I'm sorry for that. And last night was an interesting evening. Because uh, I don't know if it was something I ate or if it was a bug going around. Brother Albertson says they gave us the plague, but I don't know that I necessarily believe that. Sometimes I believe this is just a hand of God. Because probably about 2 o'clock in the morning last night, I started throwing up. And God started talking. And, you know, I'm typical human. I told the Lord, really? You're going to pick 2 o'clock in the morning while I'm throwing up to have this discussion? And he is like, yeah, I am, because I've been waiting on you to get here. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm here. And uh, he started talking to me. And he said, so you threw up. You didn't like that. And I'm like, no, I don't like throwing up. My wife didn't like it either. I kind of threw up on her back and threw up on the sheets and threw up on the wall. And it kind of went everywhere. I'm not one of those passive throw up guys, you know. I don't throw up just like, you know, boop, it just comes out. It's not like that. It just kind of goes, wow, for everything, you know. I plaster the walls. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, you know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, <clears throat> I'm sitting there and the Lord says, you didn't like that. I said, oh, man, I don't like it at all. And the smell is terrible. And he is like, okay. And so I get up and I go in the bathroom and I'm 
taking a shower and washing off. And I come back in there and I sit down and I'm like, well, I can't, I can't quite get that smell out. And I'm telling you, it was like clear as day. The Lord said, yeah, I can't either. And I said, what do you mean? He said, throwing up is like the way people like to repent. They come before me and I'm sorry, God. I'm sorry about this and I'm sorry about that. And they tell me all the things that are important to them to be sorry about. But I'm the one that has to listen to this stuff. And your repentance sounds like throw up to me. And it smells just as bad. And when you wash off, my problem is you still smell like residual. And I'm like, God, are you kidding? And, you know, I know you're sitting here going, God did this while you were in the middle of throwing up. That don't sound too spiritual to me. Well, I don't control when God does what he does, and I just kind of go with it. And, uh, and all I could think of when I got finished is when God wanted me to repent, he didn't want it the way I wanted to give it. He didn't want it the way the prophets wanted to give it. When they came before God, he directed them in their repentance. He said, I want you to weep and cry and howl between the porch and the altar. He even told Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I'm going to lay it on you so thick. There's going to be such conviction that you're going to wish your head was waters and your eyes were a river of tears. Why? So you could weep day and night. For the people. Amen. And we sit here and we go, well, you know, I think. And that's the problem. We've got a lot of eyes in there and we think a lot. And we profile and we do different things and we measure things. But we don't measure them according to the spirit. We measure them according to the flesh. And that is very true because I was one place one time and this guy was preaching a message and it struck home so vividly to me because I heard everybody before him get up and talk about programs and talk about this program and that program how we're doing drug intervention, how we're doing alcohol intervention. And we've got these steps and we've got these programs and they really help people. I'm going to say this loud and clear. You can't affect a man's spirit with a psychological means. There's no way. There's no way. The makeup of a man's mind is not the makeup of a man's spirit. God deals with the spirit. We may interact verbally with somebody on the outside. But, hey, look, here goes, I was about to say here goes nothing, but it's kind of like here goes everything. Okay? You can sit at home. And you don't ever have to darken the doors of a church. You don't ever have to come. You can do things your way. And you can get mad about things. And, and you can decide that you're going to pitch fits about things. But I'm going to tell you about fit pitching. God can handle fit pitching. Okay? And, and he can handle you if you lay out or if you rise up or any action that you take. If it's in defiance or rebellion, oh, I'm not in rebellion. I have a right to think what I think. Okay, if that's what you want to think, you go ahead. But that does not make it godly. And 
I learned more in probably four hours last night about my repentance than I have in years of repenting. You know, I thought, man, you know, as long as I tell God everything, if I lay it all out on the table, I'm good. I've cleaned myself. I've, I've, I've bore it all out before God, and he is just to forgive if I do this. And look, if you're out there in Facebook land or whatever, and you listen to everybody that tells you everything's okay and, you know, this is your best life, you go for it. That's really what you're saying is I want to go to hell from here because if a guy is going to tell you the truth, he's going to tell you that God is very concerned about the depth of your repentance. And he doesn't like it when you throw it up. I've already repented. He doesn't like that at all. Because if you're standing in this, this flesh telling God you've already repented, you've already made the mistake of justifying your flesh. And there is no justification before the Almighty God for the flesh. There is no purpose to stand in flesh before God. Well, how else are you going to stand? You have to surrender yourself to the Spirit of God and let Him have His way at all times. Amen? You've got to hunt. You've got to reach for it. You've got to desire it. The Bible says that if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you will be filled. Amen? But if you're not hungry and you're not thirsty and you just want to be curious, God's not interested in that. He's not interested in how much you've laid on the table. What You know what? He's more interested in about hunger than he is words. Amen? Well, you know, we live in such a topsy-turvy world. Yeah, we do. And there's a reason for it. Because God is asking the church of the living God to come to a deeper level of repentance. God is moving on the people of God that have named the name of Jesus to get out of their easy lifestyles and to find themselves a place of prayer and repentance and travail. The Bible says when Zion travails, souls are born. Amen? Amen. And we've all counted the countdown. You know, we started out turn of the century. You know, there'd be hundred soul revivals. There'd be thousand soul revivals. We talked about worldwide revivals that started at the beginning of the century. We've talked about the hand of God moving. And I hear preachers all the time about God's still moving. God's still moving. And then I talk to a lot of these guys and I'm saying, okay, tell me about the move of God. Well, two got the Holy Ghost. Okay. Well, that's two. That's two more in the kingdom. Okay. Well, you went over here. How many did they get the Holy Ghost? Three. Okay. Well, that's three more in the kingdom. That's fantastic. And I sit and I scratch my head and I go, Lord, why aren't we seeing the results we used to see that we read about? And it's easy to say, men don't care about God anymore. Well, let me tell you, if men don't care about God, this one guy put up one website on the Internet. And he asked one question. That's all that website was, was one question. Would you like to know more about Jesus? In one day, brother, it shut his server down. He had his own server. He got more than a million hits in one day of people saying, yeah, I'd like to know more about Jesus. Yes, I want to know more about Jesus. Yes, I'm hungry for something. And we sit here and we go, okay, well, what do you want to know about Jesus? Well, I want to know if Jesus loves me. 
Well, I have to quantify that question just a little bit. That's really not the question being asked. I want to know if Jesus loves me the way I want him to love me. I want to know if Jesus cares about me the way I want him to care about me. I just want to know if Jesus is going to bless me the way I want to be blessed. I heard a guy preaching the other day, and I, you know, a lot of things kind of bother me a little bit. Some things bother me a lot. And I heard this guy preaching, and for the whole, you know, for the part of it, I would say generally he was a better than average preacher, wasn't he? He, he knew how to get his message across. He knew how to turn the crowd to get them to stand and jump and do everything. But he's preaching, and he preached for 30 minutes on the mail. Not the mail, but the mail, like the U.S. mail. And he said nothing about God. He didn't say anything about salvation. He didn't explain anything spiritual. He talked about the mail. And these people are jumping up and down. Don't worry. Your mail is on the way. You know what my next text said? It'll be delivered in a few days. And now they're really going crazy. Praise God. You know, your blessing is on the way because God heard the request and the mail is going to be delivered in a few days. That's contrary to everything biblical. Everything biblical. He didn't do that for the Jews in the Old Testament. He didn't do that for the church in the New Testament. <laughs> he didn't even do it for Jesus. Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. We don't ever get to that prayer, do we? You know, there's a cup of sacrifice that Jesus had to deal with. But we don't get to that cup because that's not part of our group of prayers that we pray. That's not part of the program. That's not how we want to think. We want to think God is good, God is blessing, God is prosper. God doesn't want me to sacrifice anything. And that's contrary to the whole resonance of the New Testament. Everything in the New Testament was sacrificed. Everything. Paul talked about martyrs and people being beheaded and sawn in half. And he talked about the prophets. And Jesus talked about them. He said, all the blood of all the prophets. You have spilled all the blood of all the prophets. And we're like, how does that even relate to my situation? I just need a blessing from God. I'm just waiting on him to give me a good blessing. Well, if that's where you are. I'm going to tell you, friends, and I'm saying this, friends, God's not on the same page with you. He's not even close to that page, okay? He talks about a sowing and a harvest. And sowing is all about work. And harvesting is all about work, too, okay? He will give the increase. But it's not like he's mailing a letter to you with the increase. Okay? He's waiting for you to do the work. He's waiting. You know, I want to win souls. Well, get out there and teach a Bible study. Get out there and invite somebody to come to church. Well, that's not my calling. Then I guess you're not called to win souls. You know? Well... I just feel like God could do this. God could do it. God doesn't need us to do it. Okay? He doesn't need it. And guess what? He doesn't need to bless us for Him to have a kingdom that is more valuable than anything we could ever acquire 
in this lifetime. You know, we're thinking that we can add to the blessing of his kingdom. We can't bless God with anything. That's an impossibility. You know, I want to do something for God. Well, you can hang that one up. Okay? Because that doesn't work that way. Okay? Doesn't. Doesn't work that way. And I know I'm not real animated this morning. And I'm not making everybody jump up, down, and shout, you know. I mean, your Cheerios are pretty flat this morning, but... um, (laughs) Let's, uh, you know, if we want to do something that is kingdom oriented, then I'll tell you what you need to do. Just simply what you were told. Let the priests, the ministers of God, weep between the porch and the altar. You know, we all want to read these things and say, God, you showed this guy so much about you. You showed Ezekiel all the evil going on in Israel. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That evil is alive and well in the United States of America. And the church is turning a deaf ear and a closed eye to all the problems going on. We're not falling down on our faces in between the porch and the altar. That is a specific place in the church. It's from the back pew to the front pew. Finding a place with God to pour yourself out in weeping and wailing. Well, I don't weep and wail. That's just not my style. You know, that's just not who I am, brother. I'm, I'm a quiet prayer. You know, I don't get I don't get real demonstrative about this. You know, I mean. Why should I do all the weeping and wailing when everybody else is being quiet? You know, I'm just going to make a a scene out of this thing. I'm telling you, God is interested in somebody making a scene. God is interested in somebody getting beside themselves. He's interested in a person that crushes the flesh and exhibits the move of the Spirit. See, we don't realize how rawly emotional God is. We don't. We don't see that. We don't see the intensity of the emotion of God. We don't see that when God says, I love, He really means He loves. He really loves. He's not like us. The Bible says that He gives peace, but He doesn't give it like we give it. Amen. His peace is complete and it's forever peace. It'll it will keep you. His love is forever love. It is intense. It is forever. But let me tell you about love and hate. Hate is the other side of love. Hate is never the other side of like. And when God says Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. He hated Esau with as much hate as he loved Jacob. He did. And the Bible says, talking about Revelation in the last days when they come up against Israel in that big battle. All of these hordes that said he's going to come down. He's going to bring them all down on Israel. Why? Because I have hated them. Now that is not a static hate. That's an ongoing hate. That's something that started a long time ago. That God decided to continue. I hated them. I still hate them. I don't like them. Now that doesn't mean... That he's not a merciful God. I've talked to missionaries and like, I don't know how you can take that stance. Well, I got Bible that says that. Well, I know I've prayed people through the Holy Ghost in these countries. Fantastic. That just means God's mercy is working. He is a good God all over the face of the earth. That doesn't mean if they choose to stand the way they're standing in their iniquity, 
that it's not going to be the same hate that it started out with when he started hating them. And the same thing for Christians. He loved us with the same love that he loved Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? He loves us that much. He cares for us that much. He wants to do something for us that much. But he has placed us in a position that we cannot ever overlook. Ever. And that is, there's a gap between man and God. And we have got to find a place where we stand in that gap and we make up a hedge. We pray. We bend ourselves to the will of God and we weep, cry, how in between the porch and the altar that we cry aloud against the bombing the abominations that men do, the iniquity of men's hearts, the thoughts of men's minds, the attitudes that they continually creep up with, the defiance that they have, their self-willedness. Amen? These things are things that will undo anything that they've got with God. And I'm going to tell you, God is a merciful God. God is a loving God. God is a God that will reach for you, the Bible says, to the uttermost. Amen? Paul, when he saw the guy from Macedonia, he even preached a sermon in the church that I've got to go preach to the regions beyond. I've got to reach further than this. I've got to go out further. I've got to reach harder. I've got to grab as many people as I can. Paul likened it to pulling people out of the fire. Amen? Pulling people out of the fire. And people are like, well, I can't feel the fire, so I'm not worried about it. You know? Well, I'm going to hit one more thing, and I'm probably just about done. And that is, this guy, this preacher was talking and after these programs. And he said something so profound. It was like the greatest thing I heard the whole time I was there. I told you I heard about all these programs, all these teaching points, all of these things going on. And then I heard about all of the things that affect people, all the psychology that it takes to work these things, and how men are brought out of these things through an experience with psychology. And then this guy got up and preached, and he kind of brought everything together and brought the house down with one phrase. He said he was sitting there praying. And he was because I was watching him. He was sitting there praying while all these programs were going on. And he said, I'm not trying to slight anybody. But I'm going to ask you what the Lord asked me. What's wrong with me? Why do you need that? Am I not good enough? What's wrong with me? You know, why would you turn to these things when you can have a miraculous experience? Why would you turn to trust psychology when you can have a miracle in your life? Why would you trust? Look, I don't, I don't do this. I don't beat up on doctors. Doctors are fantastic. I've been to so many of them lately. I still think they're okay. But, uh, but. I'm going to tell you the truth. I stand here in front of you right now because of God, not because of medical professionals. If I would have listened to medical professionals, and I love my family doctor, but if I would have listened to him, I probably wouldn't be here right now. 
because I was diagnosed with, I don't know how many years ago, pancreatic cancer. And it don't take years for pancreatic cancer to take you out. Amen? And I've been diagnosed with four or five other things that were terminal in nature. Well, Brother Hood, no, what keeps happening? God keeps happening. God keeps stepping into the scene. God keeps taking up the cause. Amen. And if you're sitting at home right now and you're saying, that doesn't happen for me, then I want you to do two things. I want you to begin to pray right now. But then I want you to make time to come down to a church where you can have men of God lay hands on you and pray for you. Because I'm going to tell you, some things don't come except by the laying on of hands of the presbytery and by prayer and fasting. And God's not talking about you being the lone soldier. Amen. He's talking about you coming in and becoming part of a church setting and a move of God where God can minister to you and handle situations in your life. Amen. Amen. And I know that's, you know, that's just you, Brother Hud, and all you, you know, you've got these testimonies, but where's your proof? I got proof. I got proof. I got doctors that can testify to what I'm saying. And I heard a guy, I, I asked the Lord the other day, I said, Lord, you know, why do you do this to me? And I'm sitting here waiting on this really profound answer. And this guy gives me this profound answer. Brother Shelton, he says, Brothers, I want to, somebody has said this, and, you know, I'm feeling like God's going to answer it, so here's your answer. Because the doctors need the testimonies too. Because they need God just like you. Amen. Amen. Praise God. I thank God every day. Amen. That it is by sacrifice. It is by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we stand here today redeemed. It is by the sacrifice that Jesus made that we can have the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That we can receive the Holy Ghost that is promised. Amen. That Holy Ghost is promised. You say, I want something from God. Well, when you quit dictating to God what you want and let him give you what he promised, he'll give you that great promise. He will fill you with the Holy Ghost. He will change your direction. He will change your life. He'll give you a new outlook. He'll give you a new destination. Amen. And if you got an issue with holiness, well, I don't believe that's really a big subject. Let me tell you something. It was holiness that raised Jesus from the dead. And if you're going to get up one day out of that grave, it's going to be holiness that raises you from the dead. Amen. And it's going to be a faith, an active faith, a moving faith, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Brother, that's all I got. Amen. Well, why don't those of us here just start to clap our hands to the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for your word. 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 If you're at home right now and you just have the ability to, I'm just going to ask you to start repenting. I'm going to ask you to repent for yourself and just cast yourself upon God. I, I, I'm going to tell you, we've got to be clean before we, 
when we go before God. And we've got to repent and we've got to come out the other side in holiness. We've got to be holy before Him. We've got to put on His righteousness. Lord Jesus, I repent. I repent right now, Lord, of anything that I have done that has violated or gone against the will of God that has cast down the imaginations of God, that has come against the church or the Word of the living God, that God, all those things that You love, God, I want to love them. And Lord, the things that You hate, Lord, I want to stand opposed to. I want to hate right along with You. Oh God, I want to stand, Lord, in the presence of God, in the righteousness of God. Lord, if there be any spot, wrinkle, or blemish in me, anything that is unrighteous before You, God, let it be revealed to me because I want to cast it upon You. Lord, I want to stand before You, Lord, in Your holiness. In, Lord, Your holiness. In Your righteousness. I worship You, Jesus. Now, if you're at home, I'm just going to ask you to spend a moment just worshiping God with us. I worship You, Jesus. I worship You. I worship You, Jesus. I worship You. Elo mono to shito bohoni te shito to mohoni kolo bono to shimno hoti. Oh Jesus, Jesus, I submit myself to your will. I submit myself to your kingdom. I submit myself, O oh God, to the hand of God. I worship you, Jesus. 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 Amen. All of you folks at home, I just want you to keep praying and worshiping whatever you feel to do in the Holy Ghost. We're getting ready to sign off this service, and we want to thank you all for being with us on this Sunday morning. And again, I apologize that we did not open it up to the public and that you have to watch it at home, but we deeply love each and every one of you, and we're so thankful that God has put you in our lives. And if you have any questions or if you know of any friends that have questions, please reach out to us on our Facebook page and we would be glad to help or answer any questions that you might have. The only thing I want to know is I want to know this Jesus. I want to know Him. I want to know the furtherance of of His kingdom, His glory, His will. God bless you all and we will, Lord willing, see you next Sunday. And for all of us here, why don't we just gather around us?